Armed Forces Day is for those who currently wear the uniform. Veterans Day is for those who used to wear the uniform. Memorial Day is for those who never made it out of the uniform. Tomorrow, we as a nation pause to honor those who died in service to this country. Romans chapter 13 talks about giving honor to whom honor is due. That is appropriate for us to do as Christian people. And it is especially appropriate for us to be thankful for the freedoms and the privileges that we have in this country and for those who made such great sacrifices to make that possible for us. It is sinful to be people who are ungrateful. And we know ultimately that every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, James chapter 1. Today, we, the nation of spiritual Israel, the church, take time to honor him who died for us. Not once a year, once a week, in such a way that it's actually designed to keep this ever in our minds every day. Don't know if you noticed uh, the military theme to the songs that Bob selected today. That was not by accident. I appreciate him looking for those songs and, and selecting them and, and leading us in them. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness or hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are supposed to be soldiers. And this military concept is a very biblical one, and it certainly goes with the text that we want to look at today. Today we want to look at the mission that was given to Joshua. Remember that Moses led the people out of slavery in Egypt. It was Moses that went up to the top of Mount Sinai and received the law. It was Moses that led them for 40 years in the wilderness. But now Moses is dead, and Joshua has become the leader of the nation of Israel. And he is given the mission of taking them into and conquering the promised land. This was a huge undertaking, much more than I think we realize. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 1, the prophecy of God was that they would go in and drive out seven nations that were greater and mightier than Israel. The Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. Within these seven races that they were supposed to drive out, understand that they didn't all live in one city, a nation in one city. They lived in various cities, and each of the cities had a king over that city. I'll give this just a minute for these to come up. According to Joshua chapter 12, Joshua led the armies of Israel in battle against these uh, kings of these cities. Doesn't mean that, the, that they necessarily fought at that city. In fact, the city of Jerusalem was not taken until the time of David. But the king of it had come out to battle against Joshua, and Joshua and his armies defeated 31 kings in that promised land as they went in to take it over. And here, in this passage that's before us, Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, Joshua was charged to be focused on this mission that was in front of him, not to be turned to the right or to the left. 
Three times God tells Joshua to be strong and of good courage in these verses. Three times God assures him of his presence with him in these verses. Three times Joshua is commanded to observe the law carefully in these verses. And three times in these verses, God assures Joshua of the victory. That will provide us with our outline for today. Because we need to understand this, we have all been given a mission. Sometimes I don't think of it that way. Sometimes I forget about it. And we need to keep this in mind. We have our own promised land, heaven. But we are not there yet. And there are battles to be fought. There are enemies to be defeated before our promised land is fully realized, before it can be occupied. This text in Joshua chapter 1 is one of great challenge for us and also great assurance. But this text clearly shouts loudly if we understand it and apply it to us and our mission today. It shouts that we can have a winning future, that winning future that we have been studying about. We need to pay attention to the admonition that's given to Joshua here. These things were written for our learning. We can get through them patience and comfort of the scriptures and thereby have hope. So we need to take this very, very seriously. First, let's notice that three times Joshua was told to be strong and of a good courage. In verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. In verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. In verse 9, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. This admonition is needed today to be strong and courageous. The forces of Satan are active and they are intimidating. We have aligned against us the oldest and most accomplished liar that ever existed. He is shouting his lies on television, the internet, social media, news outlets, political ads, and it's, it's difficult to believe and comprehend how bold these lies have gotten and how many people are actually giving into and buying these lines. Politicians today are mocked and criticized if they make a stand against abortion. In fact, I heard one man say that being proud of the Supreme Court decision to reverse Roe v. Wade, that being proud of that was a slap in the face to all humanity. It's all right if you shrug your shoulders about that one, huh? How can it possibly be a slap in the face to say that women do not have an inalienable right to kill their unborn child? That is not an attack on women. It is not attack on, an attack on women's reproductive rights. And it is not a, an attack on women's freedom. Christians ought to rejoice in that decision and even want stronger anti-abortion laws. The Bible does not recognize any distinction between life in the womb and life out of the womb. Whatever protection we give to life out of the womb, we should give to life in the womb. Because that's the way the Bible approaches it. The same Greek term that described the babe that leaped in Elizabeth's womb in Luke 1 and verse 41 was used of the babe that the angels announced and the shepherds found in Luke 2, lying in a manger. After Jesus had been born, the same term is used. It's the same term that is used in 
2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, for a child who was old enough to learn and know the scriptures, and that from a child, that's the same Greek word there, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The fact is that the shedding of innocent blood, the taking of innocent human life, is still something God hates. Proverbs 6 and verse 17. The lies that Satan is telling are self-contradictory. They make no sense. We are actually being told the lie that women must have the right to kill their unborn babies in the name of health care and choice and freedom. And at the same time, we are being told that parents do not have the right to take their grade school children out of classes about gender reassignment and other perversions like that. In other words, I can kill my unborn child, but I have no right to control his or her education. Huh? These are the lies of Satan. Possibly you saw a recent report about a U.S. magistrate, Judge Sarah Netburn, who believed Satan's lies so strongly that she thought it was a good thing to place a biologically male serial rapist in a women's prison because he identifies as being a woman. Brothers and sisters, let us not be intimidated into abandoning the truth just because the lies are so bold. Let us not be intimidated into accepting Satan's lies just because so many other people believe them. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a, a sound mind or self-control, depending on which version you're looking at there. Fear of Satan, intimidating, allowing Satan to intimidate us. That does not come from God. We, in fact, must not be afraid of men. I love Isaiah 51 and verse 12 was an older sister in the faith. I say older. She was up in her 90s. When she pointed that verse out to me, not that I hadn't read it, but I hadn't really focused on it before. Isaiah 51 and verse 12. I, this is God talking, I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and the son of man? which shall be made as grass. God is God. He's the one we need to fear and respect and serve, not man. Matthew 10 and verse 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We need to be Afraid to be ashamed and ashamed to be afraid. In this climate, in this world around us, in this culture, do we need to be reminded that the persecutions we face here in this country at this time are minor at best? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 4, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We have not been beaten, imprisoned. We are not in danger of torture or death. And so these admonitions, be strong and of a good courage, speak not only to Joshua, but to us. Secondly, Three times in this passage, God assures Joshua of his presence. In verse 5, he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. Again, in verse 5, I will not fail thee or forsake thee. That idea of fail there or forsake is to be feeble, to be faint, to, be, to weaken. 
In Joshua 1 and verse 9, the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. This is exactly parallel to Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Think about this for a minute. Jesus told his apostles, All power, all authority is given me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Think about what that means. The apostles were being given a mission that was of much greater magnitude than the mission that was given to Joshua. But the same reassurance was given to them, I'm with you. Doesn't matter what country you go to, doesn't matter what prison they put you in, I'm going to be with you every minute of every day. I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age. Now, if it's true, and we've talked about this in the past, if it's true that that mission passed from the apostles to all Christians, then the assurance passed from the apostles to all Christians also. And Jesus was speaking to us when he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, the Hebrew writer there actually quotes from this passage in Joshua. He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men shall do to me. The fact is that our God will not fail. Our God is able. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 17, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. And they said that in the face of that fiery furnace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, Our God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God is not the weak link in this equation. There is absolutely no doubt he will hold up his end. He's more powerful than any enemy we will face. He is wiser than all the professors and philosophers. His every promise is certain. And his plan will succeed. That's the one who's with us. That's the one who holds our hands daily, always. Three times, Joshua was told to observe the law. Verse 7, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. In the latter part of verse 7, turn not from it, that's the law, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That's what he was not supposed to turn away from, the law that was given on Mount Sinai. And then in verse 8, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. If we want a winning future, as individual Christians, as a congregation of God's people, if we want prosperity for this congregation, we must not depart from the law, not to the right or to the left. This seems remarkably parallel to the, the passages that teach us we cannot add to or take away from the word of God, departing from, uh, from the law to the right hand or to the left. We need to be very, very careful not to make laws or restrictions that God did not make. That would be teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew 15 and verse 9, where Jesus says that that would make our, our worship vain. We must also not accept the liberal attitudes of our times where people are wanting to relax the commands of God as if those commands were mere suggestions, allowing things that are not part of the divine pattern. 
just give you a quick list of, of possible things that we're talking about here. Hand clapping in the worship, praise teams, children's church, expanding women's leadership roles in, in worship or in the home. Second John verse 9 addresses those who would transgress, who would go onward, who would go beyond the doctrine of Christ. And it says they have not God. We must not depart to the right hand or to the left. Someone comes along with some new idea, some new type of outreach, <clears throat> some new approach to worship, some new hermeneutic or approach to understanding the Bible. We must not evaluate such things by our own minds. What seems right to us. The question is not simply does the Bible condemn this or does it say not to do it? The question is, does the New Testament authorize this? Colossians 3.17 Whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. If it's not authorized, it is condemned by that very verse. Psalm 119, 105, David said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. How did David know what was a false way? Through the precepts of God. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, When for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to them who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We must not depart from the law. And then the fourth thing we want to look at is that three times Joshua was assured of victory and prosperity. Verse 7, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse 8, then shall thy way prosper. And then he goes on to say later in verse 8, then thou shalt have good success. These promises of God were obviously conditional. Joshua would not have succeeded if he failed to be strong and of a good courage. Joshua would not have succeeded if he turned from the law to the right hand or to the left, if he failed to observe all of the law to do it. Here's an interesting question. I never thought of it exactly this way until I was preparing this lesson. What did the observance of the law of Moses had to do, have to do with them winning their battles, defeating these 31 kings that they had to go against? Did the law of Moses lay out their battle strategies? No. Did it tell them what weapons to take? No. Did it tell them how to train their soldiers? No. Victory in battle for Joshua and his army depended on their observation of the law. It depended on... God being with them, their relationship to God. And their relationship to God depended on whether or not they observed the law. Again, we could go back. I didn't put this one on the chart, but we could go back to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. If we're going to take the gospel to the whole world, we have to be concerned about everything that Jesus has taught. And teach people to observe all those things that he has taught. We can have a winning future as a congregation and as individual Christians if we are strong and of a good courage, if we believe that God is with us, and if we will be strict and focused on obeying His law. You see, our victory depends on our relationship with God. And our relationship with God depends on whether or not we will strictly observe and follow His law. Just like it was for Joshua. And we cannot have a winning future if we depart to the right hand 
or to the left. First John chapter 5 and verse 4, we just sang. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our final victory. Revelation 21, verses 6 and 7. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He, shall, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. If we will be strong and of a good courage. If we will observe all things in the law of Christ and do those things, then God will be with us and the victory will be ours. There is no doubt of any of those things. There is no doubt of the necessity of those things. And I would remind you the verse we started with. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. This is our responsibility. And this is our task. We have a, <clears throat> Bob described it as a non-traditional invitation song today. But I think it's especially fitting for this lesson. We're marching to Zion. It brings back that military idea that we are an army. It also brings back that idea that we have a promised land that we are going to. And this is for all them that love the Lord. That we are marching to Zion. Does that describe you? Have you been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins? Scriptures teach that concept of believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins and confessing our faith in Jesus and then being buried in the waters of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Beginning that journey toward Zion, toward our heavenly home. Are you still walking that road? Are you still in that journey toward Zion? As we sing this invitation song, ask yourself these questions. If there's something we can do to help you today, we urge you to come to the front. All together we stand and sing.